was a cruel, calculated and cynical campaign of child murder involving the smallest and most vulnerable of children. No matter how you look at it, criminals aren't the nicest people. Their actions, however small, cause some form of harm to their victims, whether physical, emotional, or even psychological. Still, some criminals remain in a class of their own, as their level of depravity has condemned them to a life behind bars. Here are some of the world's most dangerous prison inmates in 2024 that you never knew existed. Some have the appearance that will make you cringe, and others, well, looks can be deceiving. Nonetheless, their crimes will leave you terrified and scampering to lock your doors, Lucy Letby. In a case that has shocked the world, nurse Lucy Letby has been convicted as one of the most prolific child killers in modern British history. Lucy Letby, a neonatal nurse from Chester, a city near Liverpool in the north of England, began her career at the Countess of Chester Hospital in 2011. Letby's job involved caring for a wide range of babies, requiring various levels of support. At first, her presence in the neonatal unit seemed like a beacon of hope for the vulnerable infants in her care. However, everything changed when Letby started working there. During her time as a neonatal nurse, there was a significant rise in the number of babies who were dying and experiencing serious catastrophic collapses. Concerns about the increasing number of deaths and collapses were raised by Dr. Ravi Jairam, a senior doctor at Chester Hospital. Dr. Jairam observed Letby's behavior and suspected that she might be involved in these tragic incidents. He brought his concerns to the attention of the hospital administration in 2015 and 2016, but his warnings were initially ignored. It was a devastating oversight that would have dire consequences for the innocent infants under Letby's care. As the number of deaths and collapses continued to rise, Letby's colleagues started to notice unusual behavior from the nurses. They witnessed instances where Letby seemed dismissive or even hostile towards her co-workers' attempts to assist in critical situations. Lisa Walker, one of Letby's colleagues, testified about an incident where Letby told off a co-worker who tried to assist an infant in distress. She said, I was shocked because you can't have enough help in that situation. Quite taken aback and shocked because it's something you would not expect a nurse to say. This behavior raised red flags among the staff, as it was completely contrary to the collaborative and supportive environment that should exist in a neonatal unit. Letby's colleagues couldn't ignore the mounting evidence of her unusual behavior any longer. They began to suspect that something sinister was happening under the guise of care. The whispers of suspicion grew louder, and the focus turned to Lucy Letby. In May 2017, the Cheshire Constabulary launched an investigation into the deaths and collapses in the neonatal unit at Chester Hospital. They were alerted to Letby's suspicious behavior and her potential involvement in these tragic incidents. Letby was arrested in July 2018, marking a turning point in the search for answers. The trial of Lucy Letby began in October 2022 at the Manchester Crown Court. Over the course of the trial, the prosecution presented a wealth of evidence against Letby, including handwritten notes found in her home. These notes painted a disturbing picture of a troubled individual, describing herself as a horrible evil person and admitting to purposefully killing the infants. Letby pleaded not guilty to all 22 charges brought against her. She maintained her innocence throughout the trial, claiming that she only ever did her best to care for the babies in her charge. Letby's defense team argued that the deaths could be attributed to alleged plumbing issues in the hospital, including raw sewage coming out of sinks and on the nursery floor. However, the prosecution painted a different picture. They presented evidence that Letby used lethal air injection on at least 12 of her alleged victims. This method became one of her her favorite ways of killing or attempting to kill children in this case, according to prosecutor Nick Johnson. I sentence you to imprisonment for life. Because the seriousness of your offenses is exceptionally high, I direct that the early release provisions do not apply. These are the words of the judge who finally sentenced Letby to life behind bars. The trial lasted for 10 months and involved complex medical evidence. Finally, on August 18th, 2023, the jury reached a verdict. Lucy Letby was found guilty of 14 of the 22 charges brought against her. She was subsequently handed a whole life order on each and every offense. Charles Bronson. The next name on this list gave British law enforcement a tough time throughout his criminal career and he is still being a pain even behind bars. It was in the mid-1970s when Charles Bronson, then known as Michael Peterson, first made headlines with his criminal activities. Born into a working-class family in Luton, England, Bronson's troubled upbringing and rebellious nature foreshadowed the dark path he would eventually take. As a young man, Bronson displayed a penchant for violence and aggression. He was involved in numerous street fights and brawls, earning a reputation 
reputation as a formidable fighter, but it wasn't until his first major crime that he truly made his mark on the criminal underworld. In 1974, Bronson attempted to rob a post office in Luton. However, the robbery quickly spiraled out of control, resulting in a violent confrontation with the police. Bronson, armed with a sawed-off shotgun, engaged in a fierce shootout, injuring several officers before being apprehended. The trial that followed showcased Bronson's volatile and unpredictable nature. He frequently disrupted proceedings, assaulting prison guards and even his own defense attorney. His outbursts and violent behavior earned him a reputation as a dangerous and uncontrollable criminal. Due to his erratic and violent behavior, Bronson was deemed mentally unstable and was transferred to the high-security psychiatric hospital Broadmoor. However, even within the confines of the hospital, Bronson's violent tendencies persisted. He attacked fellow patients and staff members, and even attempted to take hostages on multiple occasions. His relentless aggression and refusal to conform to authority made him a constant source of concern for the hospital staff. It was during his time at Broadmoor that Michael Peterson adopted the name Charles Bronson, inspired by the famous Hollywood actor. This name change would further solidify his persona as a larger-than-life figure in the criminal world. As Bronson's reputation grew, so did the need to contain him. He was transferred between various high-security prisons, including Parkhurst, Wakefield, and Belmarsh. Each transfer was accompanied by heightened security measures as authorities struggled to control his violent outbursts. Bronson's violent behavior and refusal to conform to prison rules led to him spending the majority of his time in solitary confinement. Locked away for up to 23 hours a day, he became known as one of the most isolated and dangerous prisoners in the British penal system. Despite the harsh conditions of his confinement, Bronson focused on physical fitness and bodybuilding. He penned several books, including his autobiography, Solitary Fitness, which detailed his life and offered fitness advice. His books became bestsellers, further adding to his cult status. By the 1990s, Charles Bronson had gained notoriety both inside and outside of prison. His violent reputation and larger-than-life persona made him a cult figure among some, while others feared his unpredictable nature. But it was his audacious acts within the prison walls that truly cemented his status as a legend. In 1998, Bronson orchestrated a hostage-taking incident at HMP Belmarsh, armed with makeshift weapons he took two fellow inmates hostage, demanding a helicopter to escape. The standoff lasted for several hours before authorities were able to regain control. This brazen act further solidified Bronson's reputation as a dangerous and unpredictable criminal. Throughout his time in prison, Bronson's violent behavior persisted. He engaged in numerous fights with fellow inmates and prison staff, leaving a trail of destruction in his wake. His reputation as a dangerous and unpredictable criminal only grew stronger with each passing year. Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. This right here is the chilling tale of the infamous BTK killer, a name that struck fear into the hearts of communities for over two decades. Dennis Rader, the man behind the moniker which means bind, torture, kill, stalked, raped, and murdered his victims, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. Born in Kansas in 1945, Dennis Rader harbored sadistic fantasies about torturing and killing women from a young age, but it wasn't until January 1974 that he would commit his first known murders forever etching his name into the annals of infamy. Raider's first victims were Joseph Otero, 38, Julie Otero, 33, and two of their children, Joseph Otero Jr. and Josephine Otero, aged 9 and 11 respectively. In a horrifying display of brutality, Raider bound, tortured, and killed the entire family. This heinous act was just the beginning of his twisted killing spree. Just months later, in April 1974, Raider struck again. His victim this time was 21-year-old Catherine Bright. Like the the Otero family, she fell victim to Rada's sadistic desires. He bound her, strangled her, and then ended her life. In 1985 and 1988, he committed further murders, leaving behind a trail of fear and unanswered questions. Marine Hedge and Vicky Weggle were among his victims, their lives cut short by his sadistic acts. In January 1991, Rader claimed his tenth and final known victim, Dolores E. Davis. Throughout his killing spree, Rader maintained a seemingly normal life. He was the respected president of Christ Lutheran Church in in Wichita and even served as a Cub Scout leader. This facade of normalcy allowed him to blend seamlessly into the community, concealing the darkness that lurked within him. But as the body count rose, so did the pressure on law enforcement to bring the BTK killer to justice. Little did Raider know that his insatiable need for attention and notoriety would ultimately lead to his downfall. In 2005, after years of eluding capture, he made a fatal mistake by sending a floppy disk to a Kansas TV station that detailed his next set of victims. 
victims. Unbeknownst to him, this seemingly innocent act would be the key that unlocked the door to his dark secrets. Investigators traced the disc back to a computer at his church, exposing Raider as the man behind the BTK moniker. On February 25, 2005, Raider was arrested and charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. The community breathed a collective sigh of relief, knowing that the man responsible for their fear and anguish was finally in custody. During his trial, Raider described in explicit detail how he stalked his victims, meticulously planning each attack. He referred to his plans as projects, and if one didn't work out, he would move on to the next one. Raider's testimony painted a horrifying picture of a man consumed by sadistic fantasies and a thirst for power. In June 2005, Raider pleaded guilty to all 10 murders and was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. In the aftermath of Raider's capture, the true extent of his crimes began to emerge. Investigators discovered that Raider's twisted appetite for hoarding trophies from his victims went beyond the 10 murders he had been convicted of. Authorities named him as a prime suspect in several unsolved murders and missing persons cases across at least two states. Recently, authorities in Oklahoma dug up Raider's former home in Park City, where he lived during his murderous spree. The search yielded several items of interest, including a pantyhose ligature believed to have been used to strangle one of his victims. These discoveries have reignited the investigation into the unsolved abduction of Cynthia Cindy Dawn Kinney in 1976 and the 1990 murder of Shauna Garber in Missouri. Despite the mounting evidence against him, Raider has refused to cooperate with authorities in return for amnesty. He remains incarcerated at the El Dorado Correctional Facility Maximum Security Prison in Kansas, serving his 10 consecutive life terms. Jason Barnum. Think of fear or danger. Think Barnum. His appearance alone can make the hairs on your back stand. It was the year 2012 when the world first caught a glimpse of Jason Barnum. At the age of 37, he entered the courtroom with a tattoo that covered the white of his right eye, earning him the infamous nickname Eyeball. But his journey to infamy started long before that fateful day. Jason Barnum had always been a troubled individual, living a life filled with destructive behavior and criminal activities. But it wasn't until September 2012 that his actions would lead to a series of events that would make him an international sensation. It was a seemingly ordinary day at an Anchorage hotel when the police suddenly burst into the room where Jason Barnum was staying while following a lead. Inside the hotel room, the police found a woman in the bathroom, making retching sounds as if she were sick. But behind her lurked Jason Barnum, who had no intention of going down without a fight. As soon as the woman emerged from the bathroom, Jason Barnum opened fire on the officers. Caught in the crossfire of his criminal activities, Officer Dan Thion, a 15-and-a-half-year veteran of the police department, was struck in the back by Barnum's shots. It was a terrifying moment, but luckily, Thion's injuries were not life-threatening. In a split second, the officers returned fire, their training kicking in as they tried to neutralize the threat. The hotel room turned into a chaotic scene as bullets flew and the sound of gunfire filled the air. The commotion quickly attracted the attention of other police officers, who rushed to the scene to provide backup. The hotel was evacuated and SWAT officers were called in to assist. The situation was tense as the police officers tried to communicate with Jason Barnum through the door. After what felt like an eternity, Jason Barnum finally surrendered. He was handcuffed, walked out of the hotel room, and placed on a stretcher to be taken to the hospital for medical attention. The aftermath of the incident revealed the extent of Barnum's criminal activities. Police found stolen jewelry, jewelry boxes, and other valuables in a backpack inside the hotel room. It became clear that Barnum had been on a crime spree, stealing cars and burglarizing homes to fuel a heroin addiction. Just a day after the incident, Barnum was arraigned on charges of attempted murder and felony assault. His bail was set at $500,000, reflecting the severity of his crimes. Before the shooting incident that made him infamous, Jason Barnum had already established a long history of criminal activity. Activity. His rap sheet included 14 crimes, including four felony charges, as well as convictions for burglary, theft, assault, and resisting arrest. As Barnum stood before the judge during his arraignment, it became clear that his actions had finally caught up with him. The courtroom was filled with tension as the prosecution presented the evidence against him. Barnum was charged with attempted murder, a consolidated first-degree burglary charge, and third-degree weapons misconduct. After a lengthy proceeding, a somewhat remorseful Barnum pleaded guilty to all the charges and he was subsequently sentenced to 22 years in prison. 
David Berkowitz. In the summer of 1976, the people of New York City became consumed with fear. A serial killer was on the loose, targeting young couples in parked cars. The city was paralyzed with terror as the body count continued to rise. Little did they know, the man responsible for these heinous crimes would soon be unmasked as David Berkowitz, a name that would go down in infamy. The reign of terror began on July 29, 1976, when David Berkowitz committed his first murder. Donna Loria and Jody Valenti were sitting in a car outside Loria's Bronx apartment when Berkowitz approached them. Without warning, he opened fire, killing Loria and seriously injuring Valenti. It was a senseless act of violence that would set the stage for the horrors to come. Over the next year, Berkowitz continued his killing spree, targeting young couples throughout New York City. On October 23, 1976, he struck again, this time in Queens. Carl Denaro and Rosemary Keenan were sitting in a car when Berkowitz approached and fired multiple shots. Denaro was injured, but Keenan tragically lost her life. The son of Sam, as the media had dubbed him, seemed unstoppable. His attacks were random, his victims chosen at random. Panic spread like wildfire, with people afraid to go out at night, fearing they could be the next target of this elusive killer. The city is on high alert, as the son of Sam continues to evade capture. The police were under immense pressure to catch the son of Sam and put an end to the reign of terror. But Berkowitz proved to be a cunning and elusive adversary. He left cryptic messages at the crime scenes, taunting the police and the public. One letter, addressed to journalist Jimmy Breslin, read, I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater. I am not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I am a little brat. The media frenzy surrounding the son of Sam only intensified as the body count continued to rise. The police were inundated with tips and leads, but Berkowitz remained one step ahead. It seemed like the city would never find respite from this nightmare. But then, a breakthrough came in the most unexpected way. On August 10, 1977, a parking ticket led the police to David Berkowitz's doorstep in Yonkers, New York. They arrested him without incident, and the son of Sam was finally in custody. The city breathed a collective sigh of relief as the news of Berkowitz's capture spread. The reign of terror had come to an end, but the scars left behind would never fully heal. After his arrest in 1977, David Berkowitz was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. He was transferred to the Shawangunk Correctional Facility in Wallkill, New York, where he would spend the rest of his days. Charles Cullen. Another dangerous prison inmate is dubbed Angel of Death, and he is believed to be one of the most prolific serial killers in America. Born on February 22, 1960, in West Orange, New Jersey, Charles Cullen seemed like an ordinary individual with a seemingly bright future ahead of him. Growing up in a middle-class family, Cullen had a relatively normal childhood. He attended local schools and showed no signs of the darkness that would later consume him. As a young man, he developed an interest in the medical field, drawn to the idea of helping others Others and making a difference in their lives. In the early 1980s, Cullen pursued his passion and began his nursing career. He worked at various hospitals in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, gaining experience and honing his skills. Little did anyone know that behind his friendly smile and caring demeanor, Cullen was harboring a sinister secret. It was during his early years as a nurse that Cullen's deadly spree began. Taking advantage of his position of trust and access to medication, he started administering lethal doses to his unsuspecting patients. His preferred method was was the use of drugs like digoxin and insulin, substances that could easily be attributed to natural causes. Cullen's victims ranged in age and health conditions. From the young to the elderly, no one was safe from his sinister intentions. He targeted both men and women, often choosing those who were already critically ill or close to death. This made it easier for him to cover up his crimes as the deaths could be attributed to their underlying conditions. The hospitals where Cullen worked became unwitting hunting grounds for his deadly acts. His ability to blend in and appear as a caring and dedicated nurse allowed him to continue his spree for an extended period without arousing suspicion. The sheer number of deaths under his watch should have raised red flags, but the lack of communication and oversight between hospitals allowed him to evade detection. This lack of communication and coordination allowed Cullen to move from one hospital to another, leaving a trail of victims in his wake. And Cullen's reign of terror might have continued indefinitely if it weren't for the vigilance of a friend and fellow nurse, Amy Luck. Lochran worked alongside Cullen and began to notice a disturbing pattern of deaths whenever he was on duty. She couldn't ignore the alarm bells ringing in her head and decided to take action. Driven by her suspicions, Lochran meticulously gathered evidence and documented the unusual occurrences she witnessed. She noticed the sudden and unexpected deaths of patients under Cullen's care, even when their conditions seemed to be improving. Lochran's determination to uncover the truth led her to contact the authorities and provide them with the crucial information she had gathered. 
Rutherford. With Loughran's evidence in hand, the authorities launched an investigation into Charles Cullen's activities. The shocking truth behind his deadly actions began to unravel, sending shockwaves through the medical community and the public at large. Cullen was eventually arrested on December 12, 2003, and charged with multiple counts of murder. While he initially confessed to killing at least 29 patients, it became evident from police investigations that the actual number of victims was much higher. After a harrowing court trial, the jury found Charles Cullen guilty on multiple counts of murder. Subsequently, the judge handed down multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole, ensuring that Cullen would never walk free again. Joseph James D'Angelo. The only time that you were able to see a glimpse of the true monster, Joseph D'Angelo, was in his cell in those moments. Our next stop leads to 1970s Sacramento, the dark world of a cold and wicked criminal dubbed the Golden State Killer. The reign of terror unleashed by Joseph James D'Angelo, alias the Golden State. Killer began in the mid-1970s in the Sacramento area. His first known crime took place on June 18, 1976, when he broke into a home in Rancho Cordova, a suburb of Sacramento, and assaulted a woman in her own home. This senseless assault would mark the beginning of a decade-long spree of violence and fear. Over the next two years, the man who would also become known as the East Area Rapist struck fear into the hearts of the Sacramento and Stockton communities. Authorities would later link him to 38 attacks in these areas, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. His crimes were marked by a chilling level of premeditation and sadistic pleasure. At the beginning of his crime spree, the Golden State Killer targeted women who lived alone in single-family homes. However, as his crimes escalated, he shifted his focus to couples. His method was consistent. He would tie up the male partner and then proceed to rape the woman, subjecting her to hours of torment while he snacked on their food. The level of terror inflicted by the Golden State Killer cannot be overstated. His victims lived in constant fear, never knowing when he would strike next. As the crimes continued, the Golden State Killer began taunting the police. Nine months after his first known crime, he made phone calls to the Sacramento area police, claiming to be the East Area Rapist. In one particularly chilling call, he arrogantly declared, I have my next victim already stalked, and you guys can't catch me. The audacity of his taunts only fueled the determination of law enforcement to bring him to justice. But despite the tireless effort of law enforcement, the Golden State Killer's crimes continued to escalate, and by the beginning of 1978, previous victims began receiving threatening phone calls. These calls instilled a constant state of fear in the victims, as well as in the various agencies involved in the investigation. The call Calls persisted for over two decades, finally ceasing in 2001. Emboldened by the futility of the police's search for him, the Golden State Killer expanded his crimes beyond the Sacramento and Stockton areas, spreading fear throughout the Bay Area. Late in 1978, the first assault occurred at a woman's home in Concord, marking the beginning of a new chapter in his horrifying saga. Over the next several months, a series of rapes were reported in various cities in the Bay Area, including San Jose, Danville, Fremont, and Walnut Creek. The Golden State killers. Ability to strike in different locations heightened the sense of unease and vulnerability among residents. No one felt safe, and the fear of becoming his next victim loomed large. The Golden State killer's crimes did not stop in the Bay Area. In October 1979, an intruder broke into a home in Goleta, near Santa Barbara, in Southern California. He tied up a couple, but had to flee when a neighbor heard their screams. This marked the beginning of a much more violent crime spree in the southern part of the state. In the years that followed, more people were found murdered in their homes around Santa Barbara and Irvine. During this time, the suspect in the Southern California crimes was referred to as the original Night Stalker. As his connection to the crimes in Northern California had not yet been established, the authorities were faced with the daunting task of connecting the dots and bringing an end to the reign of terror that had plagued the state for years. The Golden State Killer's crimes in Southern California came to a sudden halt in 1981, following the rape and murder of 18-year-old Janelle Cruz in her Irvine home. For years, the Golden State Killer's crimes faded from public memory, overshadowed by other high-profile cases. However, in 2001, advancements in DNA technology helped authorities link the crimes in both parts of the state. In April 2018, DNA technology would also play a crucial role in the case again as it helped authorities link the 1978 murders of a Rancho Cordova couple to Joseph James D'Angelo. This led to the arrest of the then 72-year-old former police officer officer in his home in Citrus Heights, a suburb in Sacramento. Two years later, he agreed to a plea deal that spared him the death penalty in exchange for a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Joaquin Guzman, El Chapo. One of the things I always say about Chapo is he never really cared about money. 
it was always power for him. So his ability to control people, we know at one point he had about 40 to 50 million a month going out to pay corruption and bribes within the Mexican government. From a young age, El Chapo was exposed to the world of contraband and illicit activities. He began his journey in the drug trade by shuttling oranges to the market as a child, but he soon realized that there was more money to be made in the lucrative business of drug trafficking. With the help of his uncle, El Chapo transitioned from a small-time smuggler to a key player in the drug trade. He started by coordinating large shipments of marijuana, which he transported from Sinaloa State to the United States. This early success laid the groundwork for his future endeavors. El Chapo's rise to power was marked by his ability to innovate and adapt to the changing dynamics of the drug trade. He recognized the potential of cocaine as a highly profitable commodity and began coordinating large-scale shipments of the drug. This move catapulted him into the upper echelons of the criminal underworld. Under El Chapo's leadership, the Sinaloa cartel became one of the most powerful and influential criminal organizations in Mexico and beyond. Their operations spanned international drug trafficking, money laundering, and a range of other illicit activities. At the helm of the Sinaloa cartel, El Chapo dominated the global cocaine market, establishing a vast network of distribution channels that reached far and wide. The cartel's reach extended to nearly every major city in the United States and Latin America, solidifying their position as a major player in the drug trade. El Chapo's ability to co-opt public officials and corrupt law enforcement agencies allowed the Sinaloa cartel to operate with relative impunity. This level of influence and control over key institutions enabled the cartel to protect their operations and expand their reach. The vast wealth generated from drug trafficking required a sophisticated money laundering system, which the cartel developed to legitimize their illicit funds. One of the key factors that set the Sinaloa cartel apart was their ability to innovate and adapt to law enforcement efforts. El Chapo's use of tunnels to transport drugs across the US-Mexico border was just one example of their resourcefulness. These tunnels, some of which were equipped with lighting and ventilation systems, allowed the cartel to smuggle large quantities of drugs undetected. The sheer audacity and sophistication of these operations shocked law enforcement agencies and further enhanced the cartel's reputation. The impact of the Sinaloa cartel's criminal activities extended beyond the drug trade. Their operations fueled violence and instability in the regions where they operated. The cartel's ruthless tactics, including brutal acts of violence and intimidation, sent a clear message to their rivals and anyone who dared to challenge their dominance. This reign of terror allowed the cartel to maintain control over their territories and eliminate potential threats. Despite the efforts of law enforcement agencies, the Sinaloa cartel continued to thrive under El Chapo's leadership. His ability to evade capture for many years, coupled with the cartel's vast resources and network, made them a formidable force. However, in the early hours of February 22, 2014, El Chapo's luck finally ran out. Mexican Marines apprehended him in a hotel in the beach resort city of Mazatlan. At the time of his arrest, he was the most wanted criminal in the world, with a $5 million reward on his head. Despite his capture, El Chapo's influence and criminal empire continued to thrive. He maintained control over the Sinaloa cartel from behind bars thanks to the support of his loyal associates. However, his reign of terror would soon come to an end. On January 8, 2016, El Chapo was extradited to the United States just hours before Donald Trump's inauguration as the 45th U.S. president. After a high-profile trial, he was found guilty on all 10 counts included in the federal indictment against him, including leading an ongoing criminal enterprise. He was sentenced to life in federal U.S. prison without the possibility of parole. Scared or angry? Well, remember that it is nothing compared to what the victims felt or the families they left behind. For more insightful content into the world of crime, click on the card showing on your screen.